Um, welcome to the second program of the Virginia Synod's Fall Food and Faith Series. I am Deacon Phyllis Cox, a member of the Synod World Hunger Task Force and today's facilitator. Today's speaker on advocacy is Virginia State Senator John S. Edwards. In a moment, I will give a short biography of Senator Edwards, but first I would like to introduce Pastor Kelly Bear Derrick assistant to the Bishop of the Virginia Synod of the ELCA. Open this session with prayer. Pastor Bayer Derrick. Thank you so much, Deacon Cox. Um, Y'all, I'm gonna take a moment of personal privilege because Deacon Phyllis Cox was just ordained on Saturday, like five days ago. So I enjoy calling her Deacon many, many times now because it is a brand new title for her. We're thrilled for her service. So thank you, Phyllis. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, you call your people to honor those who are in authority. Help us elect trustworthy leaders, participate in wise decisions for our common life, and serve our neighbors in our local communities. Bless the leaders of our land, especially this day, we ask your blessing upon Senator Edwards and his staff, that we may all be at peace among ourselves and be a blessing to one another. We pray also that we might be advocates for your justice and peace in all the earth, um, as called by your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for opening us with prayer, Kelly. State Senator John S. Edwards serves the people of District 21 in Virginia. Senator Edwards' district includes all of Giles County and Roanoke City, and part of Montgomery and Roanoke counties. Senator Edwards was born in Roanoke, Virginia and educated in the public school system. He graduated from Princeton University with honors, was a Rockefeller Brothers Theological Fellow at Union Theological Seminary and graduated from UVA Law School. Edwards is a practicing attorney who is married to Catherine Dabney Edwards, and they have three children and seven grandchildren. In 1996, Senator Edwards was elected as a senator to the Virginia General Assembly. Senator Edwards serves as chair of the Judiciary Committee and serves on the Commerce and Labor, Education and Health, Finance and Appropriations and Rules Committees, as well as serving on a large number of commissions that discuss and research specific subject matter in regard to legislation or public projects. Thank you so much, Senator Edwards, for taking time from your busy schedule to address the ways people can most effectively advocate with their legislators on matters of importance to them or to groups to which they might belong. Senator Edwards. Well, thank you, Deacon, Deacon Phyllis. Uh, and thanks for a very kind introduction. It's delighted to be here, especially with so many friends uh, people already know. Um, I always tell people uh, the best way to lobby for something is well before the session starts. Our sessions are in the winter. Uh, this will be a long session, six, uh, um, 60 days, roughly two months in January, February, and the first part of March. Then we come back for the, the veto session uh, six weeks later. And we ra rarely have any special sessions, although uh, 2020, we were in session in August through November off and on. And the wrong time said we had 145 days the entire year in Richmond. The House didn't necessarily go to Richmond, but the Senate did. And we, uh, after the pandemic, we were in the Science Museum. 
in the, in the summer and fall of 2020 and the winter of uh, 2021. And we hope to go back uh, to the Capitol uh, in November, in, in December. But I tell people, um, get to the legislators on whatever issue you have well before the session. The session is very busy. Um, there's little time to get into depth on very much. If you want to do it on a more personal level, do it well before. I tell people August is not too soon. If you want to submit something to the budget, uh, to the governor for his budget, or to get him to put something in his, his um, package, August is not too soon. September is certainly not too soon. In fact, now is the middle of, no, of October, and I'm beginning to tell people who want me to do something to get it in the governor's budget. I say, you're getting pretty late in the game because at the end of October, the governor has to, his cabinet is supposed to give the governor his rec their recommendations and a pre-budget uh, su uh, submission is put together to be later in November approved by the Council of Economic Advisors, depending on the economic climate. And then the governor puts his budget to bed the middle of December. And we're supposed to put our, uh, our bills to the legislative services the early part of December. We can do it later too, but there's a limit typically. So our bill's got to be in by the first, well, the, you, I think we usually have a week after we start. We've start the second uh, Wednesday in, in January, but then it happens very, very quickly. Um, and unless something's in a bill form or in a budget form early on, uh, you can amend it on the floor or in the committees. But still, there's limited time to really do any in-depth discussion with anybody. But and those are the best lobbyists get to us early on, uh, and you, so you can have time to talk about it and think about it and uh, spend more time with your legislator. So, but if you don't get it into a legislator in the form of a discussion of a particular bill, uh, what I suggest people do um, is go see the legislator in the general assembly and to make sure you have everything on one page. No more on one page. Everything's important. You can attach as many documents as you want. <laughs> Studies, letters to the editor, uh, letters in support of and so forth. But I tell people put it in one page because people may not even read that. And the one page would be as follows vote yes or no is the case to be on senate bill let's say one two three which now and don't just say what the bill is because we don't even know what our bills numbers are going to be until early january and half the time i get bills i don't even know what the numbers are myself uh so we don't think in terms necessarily of numbers bill numbers we would rather think in terms say senate bill one two three the bill to abolish uh, hunger in america <laughs> what it happens to be be specific because the bills are specific. Be concrete uh, and talk about facts. Everybody says their bill is going to create jobs or is going to bring world peace or whatever it happens to be. Everybody says that. But that's not what we want to know. OK, it's going to create jobs. How is it going to create jobs? Be very specific. For example, in Northwest Roanoke, let's say uh, we have a food desert. This is going to enable the locality to create um, stores, food stores, and in, in a community that doesn't, is not served well by the grocery stores. Because most people, when they go to the grocery store in certain areas, they'd have to take a, a bus or a, a car because there are not many in the area. And so, but this, uh, this is a true story in North Coast Rung is a food desert. We now have created a, a store up there, but still, uh, this is just an example. Um, you need to be specific exactly what this bill will do. Um, and so you say, vote yes, or very blunt, <laughs> on the Senate Bill 123, the bill to whatever the specifics are. And everything on one page, it's sort of like in politics. If you can't say it in 25 words or nothing or not, go back and figure out how to say it in 25 words or not. <laughs> because politics is, people, you go through, it's not unlike post uh, 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 boards on, on a highway, um, highway signs. If you, if you look up and you see the, the M 
and y'all, you know it's McDonald's. <laughs> but if you have to read anything, you can crash or <laughs> miss it entirely. It's kind of like that. Think of it as a build, bulletin board, um, a billboard. Uh, right, put everything in one page. Again, if you have a bunch of attachments, put the attachments in there. But the legislator, if he, that person reads the one page, you got them. They understand it. But if you have, they have to go beyond that and read a book or something, they're not going to get it at all because they're busy with so many other bills. It's unbelievable. I've had more situations where I'm going to session and the lobbyist gets me in the hallway and said, be sure and vote for blah, blah, blah. I said, well, do you have something on that? And they say, here, here, <laughs> take this. And at least I can read it and figure out what exactly they're talking about. <coughs> law law is, is very specific. It's very fact-based. If you want to discuss theology or philosophy, I'd be glad to spend an hour or two with you. You want to discuss history? I'm here for a week. Uh, I love discussing things uh, that are of general interest. But when it comes to like law and legislating, it's fact specific. Uh, I used to teach a little course at UVA Law School on trial advocacy uh, for five semesters in the springtime. And I would tell my class, so I'm not going to teach any law here in trial advocacy. I'm going to teach you facts. Does anybody know what a fact is? You get this guy, what, what's a fact? I don't know what a fact is. Well, a fact is very specific. It's what's admissible in court. If it's not admissible in court, it's not a fact because a litigation is just a fact fight. That's all it is. It's not a discussion of law. Everything, all the law goes to the judge uh, and in motions and the admissibility of evidence and instructions of the jury and things like that. But the fact, the, the jury or judge without a jury, that person deciding what the facts are. Legislation is kind of like that in a way, and that's very fact specific. You go, go before a committee and give the examples. This bill will do the following specifically, factually. And if not, somebody will ask you questions. Well, you know, how is this different than something else? Uh, and of course, um, not every bill is fixed properly. Many bills come in with a halfway thought out. Or maybe they're written okay, except that there's a problem with the bill. They didn't consider this factor or did that factor. And that's why the committees come in. Keep in mind this, every bill has got to go out of a committee. Now, sometimes in the, the clerk's office is to send a bill to the appropriate committee. My bill, the Judiciary Committee deals with crime, criminal law, civil justice issues and, and the like. Uh, but the, it, education and health, you know, it's, it's a matter of you know education and, and healthcare issues, and um, but and but in the committees is typically where the uh, amendments are done, if at all. Sometimes they're on the floor, but the committee room is where the bills are really hashed out. And if they don't get out of the committee, they don't get heard on the floor. The only exception would be if there's a similar bill, uh, you can put an amendment on it that would fix the problem. But uh, keep in mind, Virginia, unlike Congress, uh, has the single purpose rule for every bill. Every bill has to have one single purpose. And amendments don't apply unless it fits into the single purpose of the bill. Congress has these omnibus bills. They add all sorts of stuff on these bills. We don't do that in Virginia. And so keep that in mind. It's a single purpose. Keep in mind exactly what it is you want to do like you want to have a, a more food uh, service, more food and grocery stores in say Northwest Toronto. Well, and how will this help the locality in, come up with that? How, how will this bill solve the specific problem that you're trying to resolve? Um, and, and think it through very carefully. That's why lobbyists are important. I, I, people criticize lobbyists. Well, the fact is we couldn't do the job without lobbyists. And anybody in Congress would tell you the same thing. Uh, lobbyists, will, assuming they're honest, will tell you, first of all, what they, why they want the bill specifically and the arguments for the bill. And then they'll also tell you, you probably have heard the opposite. The people who don't want the bill will tell you the following. I always ask them, okay, who's against the bill? I know who's in favor, you just told me that. Who's against the bill and what will they say? Why are they against the bill? And the good lobbyists will tell you, because I'm going to hear it anyway, probably. <laughs> and so you might as well tell me now, and the good lobbyists will say, the other side is going to say the following, but we don't agree for the following reasons. Be specific, be factful. 
And so that's what I tell people, put it in one, one piece of paper, attach as many documents as you want to that one piece of paper, make it clear and, and pointed and, and to the point. Uh, again, in the winter time, we're running around with a head shop off just about, there was so many different bills. And keep in mind, it's got us to go through the, the committee process. It's gotta be approved by the committee, otherwise it's not gonna be heard on the floor. And then it's gotta go through the floor. A majority vote, Lieutenant Governor may vote if it's a tie. Uh, and then it's gotta go to the house and start all over again. So our, our six months, six week session or, or uh, two month session, 60 days. Uh, the first 30 days it's in the Senate, the next 30 days in the house, and so you need to make sure um, it's got to go through both houses and then eventually signed by the governor. And it can be fixed in any number of ways. That now often the house um, fixes the problems the Senate has messed up on, or we overlook something. It's a good thing we have a bicameral legislature. Nebraska does not have a bicameral legislature, but in the Senate, I'm glad there is a house to make sure that we've gotten it right or to fix something we didn't do correctly. And then it comes back to the Senate, maybe put it in a, a conference committee uh, and it gets out that way. But it's got to go through both houses and the governor's got to fix it. And in the governor's office, they look at it. They send down amendments uh, if they think it's necessary. And so keep that in mind. If a bill, it's not exactly perfect. And it goes to the governor. If somebody has an improvement, uh, go see the governor and he can send down amendments uh, and, and or, or veto the bill as the case may be. Any, any questions? I don't want to... Uh, maybe you've told you too much, I don't know, but I'd like to hear what you have to say. Any questions? Somebody had a question. I thought I saw it in writing there. I didn't read it carefully. Yeah, Jimmy? Um, Senator Edwards, when you when you talk about, um, you know, the one page, are you talking, for instance, a letter with attachments or would an email in which you make your points yeah. and then you attach um, um, information, is that just yeah, as powerful for you well, as a well, absolutely, paper? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, a lot of times there are bills that are, you get the, the um, kind of a, 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 um, a, a, a bunch of letters that are identical. You know, there's somebody, had a bunch of people sign them and send them, they all say the same thing. Um, that, that's okay. And uh, you just look at one and add them all up. How many people that said the same thing? It's from an organization that put it together and got people to sign them. That's fine. The best letters actually, and I always read these. Somebody writes a handwritten letter about a particular issue. I always read those and we respond to them as well because you know somebody spent some time sitting down and writing them out, either typed them out or whatever. Uh, and there, the, you, you really wanna read those because they come from the average citizen who's concerned about a particular bill or a particular issue. And so we always make sure we read them and respond back. So um, there's nothing wrong with form letters, but um, the personal letters actually are read. <laughs> you read, maybe read one form letter and then got 20 more and they all say the same thing, which is, at least you know there are 20 people, but sometimes people just sign them because they're told to sign them and they belong to an organization. And uh, so, uh, which is fine. But uh, again, the more personal letters, the better. And what about today's um, things like, I know you probably get inundated with social media. Yeah. Do you, do you really, pay any attention to Twitter and Facebook. And I mean, honestly, as I'm just speaking as a citizen, I enjoy updates, for instance, like if a politician posts something they've done and they post it on Facebook, but I've gotten to where I don't read the comments because most of them are just noise, if you will. But I do, I do wonder if, if anybody pays attention to that. Well, at my age, I don't use Facebook. <laughs> or any of that stuff. Uh, I do eventually, sometimes I use, uh, I do email. I figured out how to do that sometimes. I get emails um, and somebody said, well, I texted you the other day. I said, well, I don't do very good at 
reading my text is, <laughs> I, I, I know how to do it. I've done it and I read the text, but I'm used to telephones. <laughs> I'm used to typing it out or, um, or if somebody wants to get in touch with me, the telephone works pretty well as far as I'm concerned. Um, and also you can back and you know, back and forth. It can be informal and it get people, people can explain themselves on the telephone. It's kind of hard to do even with a, with a text or a, a email. So anyway, it depends on the person. The younger people, they did all that stuff. I, I don't do YouTube. I don't do that stuff. <laughs> Yeah, Jimmy. Okay, you're, you're muted. Um, the elected officials are overwhelmed, so you have to be very staff dependent. Do you have Do you have good and adequate staff, or is that something that could grow and improve? Well, one of them is here, so I have to say yes. I have yeah. two. <laughs> I have two uh, two a chief of staff and. And another, and he said, "Yes, he's he's very helpful." <laughs> yeah, are, yeah. Are they are they year round? Yeah, we do. We used to have one staff, but being in December of nineteen, when the Republicans were in charge, they decided we all needed two staff, which has been very helpful. Yeah, they're year round, um, and um, I, I mean, they, they do stuff I couldn't do. They're good at doing research as well, and uh, and. Finding and getting people wanted me to send amendments into the budget for the for the governor's budget, and so we processed of getting some letters out to these people to the governor's office based on requests for budgetary amendments. So a good example is uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, Library. I happen to be on the board, and they want some more money, so I'm putting in something on like that. The Wrong Higher Education Center that I'm still set it up. I, I kind of initiated that and I'm the, still the chairman of the board and it's been very successful. And and Kay Dunkley, the, the executive director says, we need extra amount of, extra amount of money for uh, some improvements to, to the building. And so I'm always putting budget amendments in for that. Virginia Tech's part of my district. And so they asked me for different things and I've, I put in a lot of budgetary amendments there. And occasionally there's something like, uh, I, several years ago, I doubled the size of the uh, uh, the CRC, the uh, um, commerce, the um, commerce corporate, corporate research center at Virginia Tech, and so I put in the bill to double the size um, and uh, at their request. And so I have a lot of natural constituencies, and so um, they're always asking me to put something in. So again, the sooner the better. I tell them August is not too soon. Uh, if to try to get in so the governor will support it. But uh, if he doesn't, I, we can still put it in in December and January. But uh, you, you can't do it without the staff. And like you can't do it without lobbyists. Lobbyists are very important. People criticize lobbyists. I understand that. But I guess lobbyists like lawyers and uh, used car salesmen um, are in the same category, I suppose. <laughs> but you, you need lobbyists to explain things to you that you wouldn't understand otherwise. I'll give you an example. Last year, let's see, I had a bill I've been working on for some time uh, to uh, have to do with uh, lower the price of prescription medication. Uh, and um, it's a complicated bill. And I work on the Joint Commission on Healthcare. And I got a staff member spent two years putting it together. We finally uh, got it together and got it out of committee. But then the governor's office decided a lobbyist got to the governor's office, which and wanted an amendment, which I didn't like at all. And we finally uh, we killed it in the Senate, uh, despite the fact the governor's office, I just thought they, the, governor, the lobbyist got to the governor's office and I, I didn't like what happened. So, <clears throat> but uh, it's important to the other lobbyists who agreed with me, they could explain things to me that I didn't fully understand either. It was a complicated bill. Mm -hmm. I have a question, uh, Senator. Um, yeah. uh, I, uh, what can you, after you submit uh, or send the bill uh, to you or a proposal, uh, then it goes into the Senate process, as I understand it. And uh, is there any way to follow the bill uh, in the sense of what happens, what happens in the Senate and, and is there a mechanism for giving uh, 
you or whoever it might be additional information uh, about it to answer a question or to, to correct a misconception. All bills to be submitted to the Division of Legislative Services. Well, almost all of, I think all of them are, uh, have law degrees. Um, and they uh, write the bills. Uh, I can write my own bill, yes, but uh, it's better to go through them. Uh, they're, they're assigned to different areas of the law. For example, in the Judiciary Committee, there are two lawyers that work closely with me and to the staff, uh, to the uh, committee to draft all the bills that deal with, uh, at least in the Senate side, that deal with legal issues and criminal issues, civil law and criminal law issues. And they're very knowledgeable and they're very, very helpful. And uh, I, we couldn't do without them. They're, they're, well, they're extremely well educated and they know the code of Virginia very, very well. So anybody that tries to put in a bill without going through DLS, Division of Legislative Services, is making a huge mistake. Now, you don't see the bill until you're ready to put it out, submit the bill uh, to the General Assembly. Um, and there's a deadline for doing that. Um, but in terms of following the bill, you would not know that there's a bill that I put into Legislative Services unless I tell you so. Occasionally, uh, somebody knows I put in a bill and they want to speak to the staff. And they basically staff won't talk to them unless they have permission. Uh, and so, um, but, and often I say, yeah, sure, go talk to them. Especially if somebody, a lobbyist has asked me or a constituent of mine has asked me to put in a bill and they want to talk to the staff to fix the way they want it. And I say, yeah, sure. So I, I, I tell legislative services, you're welcome to talk to this person. So, but it, once this, you will not know that there's a bill until it's put into the system through the clerk's office. And the clerk of the Senate assigns the bills to various committees based on the code of the bill. If the code deals with 18.2, you know, for example, is a criminal code, uh, and that would go to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, somebody, something dealing with education, for example, go to the Education and Health Committee. But once it's in the committee, you can re-refer re to something else. And often a bill has to go to committee first, but it needs, because of the fiscal impact, it's got to go to finance. So we uh, report the bill and re-refer to finance. So it goes through two committees. And then it's still, still got to go to the floor. I don't know if that Senator, yeah. Senator mm -hmm. Edwards, um, yeah. we Thank have you. two questions. One is, um, can we do anything at the state level to lower drug prices? Too many folks must buy drug, buy food rather than drugs or the opposite. And that's from Ben Crawford of the Blacksburg AARP. That's that's that was a question to you, Senator Edwards. Looks like his internet connection might be unstable right now. He's cutting okay. out. Okay, we got you back. Okay, sorry, sorry yeah, yeah, that's okay. Luke Pretty's showing his usefulness by coming in here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Um, the question is from Ben Crawford of the Blacksburg AARP. Can we do anything at the state level to lower drug prices? Too many folks must buy food rather than drugs or the, the opposite. Absolutely. Um, I've been working on that um, as a member of the Joint Commission on Healthcare. And I had a bill dealing with, um, uh, hey Luke, what's the name of those people? Yeah, the, the, the people who you've never heard of before pharmaceutical benefit managers. They're well known by the pharmacies, 
but uh, nobody understands who the pharmaceutical benefit managers are. It's gotten a lot of attention in other states as well. We learned that the pharmaceutical benefit managers are the people that tell pharmacies, uh, tell the, uh, the insurance companies what to pay. And the way they do it keeps the prices high. And so we passed a bill to, uh, to, um, to regulate the pharmaceutical benefit managers through the Bureau of Insurance. And there were only about half a dozen or so pharmaceutical benefit managers in the country, and they dominate everything. And I learned, we learned how the way, best way to deal with them, regulate them, and then abolish a certain form called spread pricing, one form of setting the price, which keeps the prices very, very high. So if you want to know something about the high price of medications, do some research on pharmaceutical benefit managers. They're making a killing. <laughs> a good example is they tell the, um, the insurance companies to pay the manufacturer $10, let's say. Uh, and then they tell the uh, pharmacies, they say they tell the uh, uh, dollars to the pharmacy and then they sell it for they the um, insurance company pays twenty dollars and they keep the difference <laughs> that's a extreme example but that's the kind of thing that's going on it's too complicated for the average person to understand that there's so many different ways for them to make a big a profit insurance companies to make a fortune the pharmacies are, the uh, manufacturers are making a fortune but the pharmaceutical benefit managers or skewing the price even worse. So that's just one example. I'm not saying that solves the problem, but that's one example that we're doing in Virginia. Several other states are doing the exact same thing. We found out that Medicaid, for example, is paying a whole lot more than they ought to be paying uh, because of uh, pharmaceutical benefit managers. And that was one of the bills that we worked on for two years. I was proud of the fact that we got it out. Um, then CVS, decided to get to the governor on what they said was a tactical amendment, which we'd already killed in our committee. I said, governor, you're making a big mistake and they didn't listen to me. So we killed it on the floor of the Senate. I'm really proud of the fact we killed it on the floor. <laughs> um, I can think of some other examples. Um, another thing we did, you've heard of, heard of um, uh, surprise billing. Example would be you go to the, have an operation and the anesthesiologist uh, sends you a surprise bill. It's not covered by your insurance. And so they decide to send the bill because insurance, they, they're not in the network. And so they've decided they can make more money not being in the network. And so they send you the bill, which is a surprise. Nobody had any idea you had a, an, a, a separate bill. You thought insurance was gonna cover it all. And next thing you know, you get a bill that's never seen before. And how often did you see the anesthesiologist? Well, maybe 30 seconds before they put you under. <laughs> you don't even know the guy's name, never heard of him before. And so he gets a surprise billing. And so we killed that, we fixed that last year. I worked on the subcommittee on that. And uh, the um, these big insurance companies won one version and we came with another version. And so we made it so that your own insurance will have to pay this surprise bill, whether they like to or not. And, if, and what they will pay will be standard, reasonable, and usual, ordinary, necessary. The Bureau of Insurance will mediate and figure out between among the parties. Uh, the, your insurance will pay it. And the anesthesiologist, for example, he'll get paid, but not necessarily what he was going to charge. And, but he'll get paid something reasonable. So that's it. we spent a lot of time on that bill. That was a very important bill. So we've, we've outlawed surprise billing, which is become more and more common, but there are a lot more problems. I mean, the biggest problem is the insurance companies themselves making a fortune. Um, the pharmaceuticals making a fortune, the manufacturers making a fortune. Um, and we need to, uh, what Congress wants to, and we looked into this, but only Congress can really do it well, is buy um, insurance from, or buy pharmaceuticals from Canada. It's a lot cheaper in Canada. But there are a lot, a lot of problems with, um, I, I was on, 
a Zoom call yesterday with a classmate of mine from Princeton, uh, Tom Reed, T.R. Reed, who wrote the book, Healing of America, a good friend of mine. And he was talking about the Healing of America, the book that, that everybody read and is still reading about the best way to fix the problems in America in terms of our insurance. And um, this book came out before the Affordable Care Act was passed, but he has some ways of how, how can we fix the Affordable Care Act. And he was talking about the same issue you know, that our country is 37th in the world in terms of the cost of health care. And yet we're the richest country in the world. And we have, we're worse in so many other categories. We're the best in the world when it comes to sophisticated medicine, which is extremely expensive, very bad in terms of, of the average citizen. And even though the Affordable Care Act has done a lot of good, it's, and the, we finally expanded Medicaid in Virginia. But uh, this issue is still a problem, a serious problem. There's something like 30,000 Americans still don't have any insurance at all. And like another 60, 60, 60 30 million, and about 60 million Americans uh, have, are underinsured um, and are not just underinsured, they have inadequate health care. So the issue of health care is still a huge issue in this country. The, the um, Can Canadians love their system. The English love their system, which is basically the tax, it comes out of your tax dollars. It's free in Canada, in, in um, it's free in England. In Canada, they have one insurance company that is run by the government, and that insurance company pays all the doctors, and it's a lot cheaper, and, and everybody loves it. Everybody is covered. And in Germany and France and Japan, they have a system that was established in 1880 by Otto von Bismarck, of all things. He's the one that gave us social, the concept of Social Security in the 1880s. And the system in, in Germany is everybody has to have private insurance, but they're all not for profits. You think we could ever have not for all not for profit insurance companies? Not exactly in this country, but in, in Germany and France and I think in Japan, um, you have uh, insurance that uh, is, everybody has to have it. It's all not for profit. The regulation, the uh, the uh, charges are heavily regulated. The charges that, that the doctors pay is heavily regulated. Everybody loves it. Nobody makes the doctors don't make a fortune as they, and the hospitals don't make the kind of fortune they make in this country. But everybody's happy, basically, with um, the, the, the the German model, the the English model. They love it. Canada, they love it. But America, it's still a mess. We made progress, but we got a long way to go. Senator Edwards, um, another question that's in the chat is um, from Judith Cobb. What items in the present Virginia budget are aimed at the homeless and the hungry? That's a good question. I, I don't really know. Um, I'll be glad to look in to see where we are on this. Uh, I, I don't know the specific answer to that. Hey, look, do you know? <laughs> What do we have in the budget that would relate to the hunger, the, the hunger, hunger issue in, this, in Virginia? Do you have, uh, you have any idea? There's something on food deserts. Somebody... Yeah, we have something on food deserts. He's looking to, but this, I'm sure there's a, that's a complicated question. It's an important question. Well, food deserts are certainly um, yes. important and also the transportation to get um, public transportation in order that there are less food deserts as well um, is is so important because so many counties in Virginia are not served by public transportation whatsoever. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Uh, I remember years back, oh, 15 more years ago, I had a bill in to abolish trans fats in the public school system. And to have the superintendent of public schools to provide a model of food that you can purchase that did not have trans fats. I got more flack from that from a Republican delegate, I should say. Uh, it's people not, not the same party of mine. I couldn't even get it, I got it out of the Senate. I couldn't get it out of the subcommittee in the House. It was so irritating. They would not deal with it. One de delegate uh, said to me in the committee, what makes you think that the Richmond knows better than the localities do? And, and it's like, everybody, everybody can use some help in terms of the menu, what to buy that has no trans fats. 
uh, we've made a lot of progress. Is the public has gotten on board with no trans fats. I recall in uh, New York City, the mayor may have been Bloomberg back then. Uh, said that uh, we're going to abolish trans fats in New York City. And people said in 18 months, and people said, you know how many restaurants are in New, New York City? That's not possible. Guess what? They did it. <laughs> they just did it. In 18 months, trans fats were gone in New York City, and pretty soon it picked up across the country. Now, uh, a lot of uh, restaurants are, are advertising no trans fats. <laughs> so they did it. Even McDonald's took trans fats out of the, <laughs> the uh, French fries. They figured out how to do it. So you can do it if you try. And like I said, I don't think we have trans fats in the public schools uh, lunchrooms anymore, as far as I'm aware. I know they've, they've gotten onto that. That's just an example. Right. Any other questions for Senator Edwards? Judy, you got any questions? <laughs> I have another one. It's, okay, uh, Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Charles, Charles. Okay. Um, we're in the time of COVID, and I'm sure everything has been changed. I mean, it's really impacted the legislature as it has uh, other entities within our society. Do you have any examples specifically that, that well, or, or examples that you've learned some things that you I will benefit once uh, we get through all this. Is that a clear question or? Exactly. Um, one of the things is I think we've gotten used to Zoom meetings. I've had more Zoom meetings last year and a half than ever in my life. And people have gotten used to it. And it's really helpful because I don't have to go to Richmond for meetings. I've had meetings where I could stay here instead of showing up. I'm on a lot of committee meetings and, uh, and commissions. And like this morning, um, I was on a Zoom meeting as well, uh, having to deal with the forensic sciences. And uh, for two hours, uh, hour and a half, or maybe two hours, a Zoom meeting dealing with um, forensic science issues. And um, so I'm spending a lot of time with Zoom meetings, which very, it's very helpful to avoid having to travel three hours to Richmond and back, and then three hours back. So that's one thing I've learned. I think we've all learned that. Uh, we, for a while there, we could only have Zoom meetings when the governor says there's an emergency, which is no longer in place. But we're, a lot of us are looking at putting in a bill to allow more Zoom meetings uh, throughout the state um, on a regular basis. So that's something we've all learned. As far as um, the pandemic, I just hope everybody figures out how to get vaccinated. <laughs> there's no solution to it without everybody being vaccinated. That's still a problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. How do you make sure everybody's vaccinated? I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't work. Shaming doesn't work. <laughs> I just was in a meeting with someone who said that what seems to work is that and this is an unfortunate thing that um, when someone they know becomes very ill with COVID, then the circle around them seems to vaccinate, gets vaccinated. But that's yeah. a very sad and very lengthy process. A neighbor of mine who's a pastor of a conservative Baptist church, they're conservative Baptists. And, uh, but he, he um, been telling his congregation, get vaccinated. It turned out he did come down with COVID a couple of weeks ago. Ben, did you have something that you wanted to ask Senator Edwards? I had a couple of questions. One is that we really, really need to do something to upgrade the internet system, as we can plainly see today, uh, both in the New River Valley and in Roanoke. Uh, and, and I can put that in a question, but also 
uh, Senator Edwards is a hero up here because he's the, the father of the coming uh, railroad passenger system into the New River Valley. And I wanted to ask him, what's, what's the latest information on, on that? Well, I understand there was a meeting yesterday, which I did not go to, but I understand um, we should, at least from Roanoke to Washington, get a second train next February, I believe it is, uh, February 22, from Roanoke to Washington and back. So we have two trains out of Roanoke in the morning to Washington and two uh, coming back uh, in the evening, uh, two trains. That will help. But in terms of getting Amtrak to uh, Christiansburg, we uh, passed legislation in 2020 to create a rail passenger authority. I've been pushing for a rail authority going 20 years ago. I couldn't get it, got it through the Senate, couldn't it never get it through the House. But now that this, a certain party is now in charge of both the House and the Senate, we can get a lot done. And it's the most um, expansive transportation uh, bill we have had in 35 years since Jerry Blouse was governor in 1986. It, it's uh, We increased the gas tax, of course, which made it possible for 81 to be worked on right as you see it right now. And the Rail Passenger Transportation Authority has the authority to acquire right-of-ways. An example would be between Salem and Christiansburg, 28 and a half miles uh, right-of-way is being acquired from Norfolk Southern. And we're spending $250,000, $250 million uh, over the next couple of years to ex improve the trackage to Christiansburg, which is necessary to get Amtrak to go to Christiansburg. Uh, we spent $110 million to improve the track from Lynchburg to Toronto to get Amtrak to Toronto from the time I got the bus started in 2011 to the time we got Amtrak starting in 2017 to, uh, out of Roanoke to, to go to uh, Lynchburg. Is that the railroads historically have simply have not um, improved their their right of way. They've declined. They've uh, allowed it to um, be to decline, and that's why they can have freight that goes, let's say, from Christiansburg to Roanoke, uh, thirty miles an hour. But you need to, anybody going to Amtrak, you need to go about at least seventy miles an hour or thereabouts. And to get that done, we need to improve the line. Like we spent $110 million to get from Lynchburg to Roanoke, now we're spending about $250 million to go 28 and a half miles. There's more to it than that. Part of it has to do with simply acquiring the right of way from Norfolk, from Norfolk Southern. But the railroads throughout the country have not maintained their right of way uh, of their, uh, their trackage like they should have. In fact, they've, they've abandoned half the lines from 1960 to 1920, 1960, about 2020 or something like that. 2010 maybe, half the lines have been abandoned uh, throughout the country because the railroads are not interested. You know, they gave up uh, passenger rail in 1971 when Amtrak was created and had no interest. And also the interstate highway system was one of the factors there too. People would rather drive a car, but um, the railroads have not maintained the right of ways. And, and like I say, they don't really have to go but so fast with the freight, but to, for Amtrak, you gotta go faster. So we hope to have Amtrak out of Christiansburg. Who knows? I've been, we're, you know, we had this NRV Rail 2020. Uh, uh, the rail, it was called NRV Rail 2020 a great, uh, organization to get the Amtrak from Christiansburg in, by 2020. Well, that was last year. It didn't happen. But hopefully by 2024, I think the, the target date is 2024, 2025 at the latest. We'll have Amtrak out of Christiansburg, and um, Chris Hurston and I got the the bill passed to create a, a passenger station, which would be important out of, out of Christiansburg. What's that? Water research, very quickly. Yeah. Sir McClellan had a bill, um, item ninety-seven in the budget. Okay. But uh, the Virginia Food Access yeah. Investment Program, three million. First year, under twenty-five thousand. Okay. Year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's had more in Luke Pretty's been telling me that Senator Jennifer McClellan had the Virginia Food Access Investment Program and Fund uh, that passed um, in 20, 2020 uh, to create the Virginia Food Access Investment Program of three million dollars, three three and a quarter million dollars, something like that. It's part of the governor's roadmap to end hunger. 
in an earlier uh, last year, COVID-19, they originally put a million dollars in the program, but when COVID-19 hit, they increased the program to $3 million. Um, and this last December um, released grants for grocery stores. And I think it's currently funded in the budget under item 97. Okay, there you go. That's why I yeah. said- I forwarded something to fill this. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you so much, yeah. Senator Edwards and Luke. <laughs> Um, so, um, are there any other questions for Senator Edwards? <clears throat> Senator Edwards, Dave Scola, how are you today? Mm. Can you hear me? He no. may be um, frozen a little bit, Dave. Uh, oh, okay. Just give, give him a couple of seconds. He's coming back. There you are. Dave Scola has a question for you, um, Senator Edwards. Well, Senator yeah. Edwards, good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you for doing this. And um, quick question for you for congregations. Um, we, we have many opportunities throughout the Commonwealth to participate in, in hunger ministries, feeding ministries. Um, what would be helpful from your point of view for congregational members for advocacy to uh, make your job more streamlined and more supported in regards to hunger issues? What can we do uh, to encourage the legislators? Uh, there's, you know, an organization of um, Interface Center for Public Policy, one of my, probably my favorite um, lobbyist group. The Interface Center for Public Policy is not pushing um, the usual commercial issues um, or any uh, particular um, interest group that we have for most everything else, but rather only things that are good. And um, I've been uh, very supportive of probably everything the Interface Center for Public Policy has been working on. And um, the, I'd, I'd work through them. They're very important. They have people in Richmond that we can talk to directly on a regular basis. But I'd, I'd work closely with the Inter, Interface Center for Public Policy and get them involved in whatever the issues are. That's. They, it's a statewide organization that's very important, and I've, I've been very close to them over the years. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And finally, a follow-up question. Uh, can you recite the words of the Patrick Henry fight song? <laughs> you know, the answer is no, because it was built, it, it was I was a first class, and while I was there, <laughs> we, we we created it and i never got it never i'm not sure i can what is it i i really um you're, I'm not you're, sure I'm Kat, Kat, uh, kathy knows it. <laughs> she probably does it she probably does but we uh when i was there we uh i was first class first class president uh, student body president and um we we came up the the purple and white you like that Yep, yep, yep. Okay, we came with that, and we came up with the the, the Patriots. You like that? Good <laughs> and job. so we we came up with different things. Uh, so we we're responsible for a lot of the things. Statesman, I think, was our, our um, newspaper, and um, a lot of things like that. But um, I don't know. I'm not sure we got the song done that year. I just don't remember. But, <laughs> well, Jim go Cobb, Patrick Henry. Go Patrick Henry. <laughs> Jim Cobb, did you go to Fleming or where'd you go? Yeah, Fleming, Colonels, right, blue and gold. Yep. <laughs> let's get a let's get a little yeah, a little little contest of the fight songs between <laughs> Fleming and, and PH. <laughs> long, long rivals. Yep, yep, for, yep. Ev for everyone, including those not in the Roanoke Valley. Um, <laughs> I'm in Roanoke County, by the way. So anyway, um, I dropped into the chat the um, website for the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy that Senator Edwards referenced and also 
noted the Synod's Do Justice newsletter, which Lene dropped in, um, how you can sign up for that, often shares information from the VICPP. Um, and then finally, the Interfaith Center organizes Days for All People, um, which is advocacy days with the General Assembly. Um, it is in January, as the Senator mentioned, in the midst of the session. And if you've, ev if, if you've ever been, um, when we had it in person, it's chaos. Um, so, um, but this year, I think it's going to be a hybrid with some workshops online and also possibilities for in-person deacon Phyllis Cox is working on that. But um, I, I will echo the Senator's um, lifting up of the Interfaith Center for Public Policy, which is in part funded by ELCA World Hunger. It is our um, Virginia State Advocacy, Lutheran Advocacy Office, and it is interfaith with our brothers, sisters, and siblings from other Christian organizations, as well as um, interfaith organizations. They do phenomenal work. Um, so, you can get more info on the things that were dropped in the chat. I wanted to say that, especially for those of you who might be joining um, either on phones or not be able to see what's in the chat. So, most of the things that um, the that are dealing with the poor come out of the Interface Center. Almost everything. We don't get too much from all the say. Um, the utilities or the banks or people like that, which are fine people, I'm sure, but they rarely are talking about what we need to do to help the poor. But we do from the Interface Center. In fact, almost everything when it comes to the poor, the things that Jesus talked about, and Jesus is all about the poor, it comes from the Interface Center almost exclusively from my perspective. My perspective. Well, Senator, I, I would disagree just a hair because mm -hmm. Uh, Virginia uh, Interfaith Power and Light uh, does address issues on water and access to water, which also is something that was very yeah. dear to Jesus' yeah. heart. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say point of order on that one. Uh, <laughs> mm. <laughs> and and since I work for them, you know it, it kind of. <laughs> um, we are running just a hair over, so I am going to um, close us with prayer today. Senator Edwards, it's Thank indeed you. been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And thank you, all of you, for participating in this second program of the Virginia Synod's Fall Food and Faith Series. We hope that you will be with us on November 11th when we meet with a representative from Bread for the World. And with that, the Lord be with you. Also with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the ability to meet together today to discuss things that are of importance to us and also to you and your kingdom. We give you... Um, Thanks for people who represent us so strongly in the needs that others have and that we have um, with our state legislature, especially Senator John Edwards. And we wish him and his staff um, Godspeed as they travel back and forth to Richmond and give uh, him the mind of Christ that uh, he makes good decisions for his constituents. All this and uh, any other things that you know that are in our hearts, we ask in the name of your son, our risen Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all very Thank much. Thank you so much. It. Thank you. Thank you for your time, Senator Edwards. Thank you.